Ladies and gentlemen, as you now know, I am an undertaker. Yes, I am an undertaker. I am a third generation undertaker. Jimmy Buffett likes to say he's the son of a son of a sailor. Well, I'm the son of a son of an undertaker. Now, third generation means that my grandfather and my father before me were undertakers as well. I've even got a brother who's my business partner in the funeral home with me. So, yes, I guess you could say that in terms of the family business, I'm pretty much buried in it. <laughs> Groaner. Yeah, just in time for Halloween, right? We get all those groans out. So I like to think of myself, though, as, as a, a new school, new school undertaker. And my father, definitely old school. So please laugh if you can relate to this story about new school, old school. So this one particular day, I'm working the door with my father at a visitation, working as a greeter. And one of my dad's buddies walks through the door and says, hey, Tom, how you doing? engages him in conversation, says, so Tom, you ever get depressed in this business? And my father said, yes, sometimes I do get depressed. But then somebody dies and I just snap right out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Got the difference between new school and old school. And I think you can apply that to any one of your professions. We've got three generations, like Tim was saying, in the workplace. We've got those millennials. We've got uh, older folks. We've got people, uh, Generation X, Y, you know. Folks, I like to begin with a few funny stories because I think it's so important to laugh in the funeral business and all of our businesses. And believe it or not, there is humor in the funeral profession. Just like all of your professions, there is humor, believe it or not. You just have to dig a little deeper for it. You've got to dig a little deeper for it. Yeah, some, some more of those groaners, yeah. Well, for example, we always ask for a picture. Whether someone is making their prearrangements ahead of time or whether they're making them, you know, if someone has passed away. We always, always, always ask for a picture. So we can see, ladies, how you wear your hair and your makeup. Gentlemen, how you wear your hair. If somebody has glasses, if someone's got a beard or a goatee. So we always ask for a picture, whether it's a pre-need or an at-need. So this one particular time, I was uh, making the arrangements with a woman ahead of time. It was her pre-arrangements. So she brought in a picture. She comes into the funeral home, and she hands it to me, very, very serious-like. She says, now, Justin. I want you to make me look like Marilyn Monroe. And that's, you know, that's not, not a bad thing, right? Not a bad thing. Except this is the way she looked. <laughs> and I said, I said, lady, with all due respect, I'm a mortician, not a magician. This one other time, um, a man was coming in to make his... Uh, make his arrangements for his mother. And his mother had passed away. And um, we give everybody a little bit of time to go into the parlor and, and view their deceased loved one. And we're always a little apprehensive. It's, it's horrible for the family. It really, really is. It's hard for the family. It's one of the, the most difficult times you ever have to experience. And we really, really want to make them look like themselves when they were alive. That's another reason we asked for that picture. And sometimes we can, and sometimes we can't. You know, we, we can only deal with what we've got. So believe it or not, as apprehensive as you are at the beginning of a visitation, we're apprehensive too on the other side. So when I let the gentleman go in and view his deceased mom for the first time, I give him a few minutes, give him about five or ten minutes. And after five or ten minutes, I go up to him and, and I approach him, and I ask a little apprehensively. I, I really want him to be pleased with the way his mom looks. So I say to him, I say, John, uh, John, how does your mom look? Does she look okay? And John says to me, he says, Justin, if my mom would have known she'd look this good dead, she would have kicked the bucket 10 years ago. <laughs> so yes, yes, as you can see, folks, there is humor in the funeral profession, just like all of your professions. And I think it's so important to laugh in business. And you probably weren't expecting me to come up here and tell some jokes today. You probably might not have been expecting that. But my point, and please folks, please, don't mistake my humor for insensitivity. I think you'll find that, that funeral directors, myself included, are some of the most compassionate, understanding, 
and nice people, believe it or not, that you'll ever meet. And honestly, if any of this information has reached you at a difficult time, perhaps you've recently lost a loved one. Maybe someone you know has been diagnosed with a terminal illness. If that is the case, then honestly, you have my most sincere and my deepest sympathies. I'm really sorry about that if that's the case. My intention is not to offend you, but rather it's to make you think and laugh a little bit and have a little bit of fun. I tell my families, the, the, the families who can laugh during this time are the ones who actually get through it better. Humor is therapy. Humor is healing. And we need that in our businesses and our jobs, even maybe on the worst day of someone's life. So embrace that humor. If you don't mind laughing a little bit, having a little bit of fun, uh, I think we're going to get along just fine. So folks, people, people have different names for what it is I do. They have different names for what I do. They call me, of course, undertaker, mortician, funeral director, funeral service professional. But the term I like the best, and the one that I use to describe myself, is funeral service professional. I like this term, and I do use it to describe myself because of the emphasis on the word service. Because service is, after all, not only what I do, but service really and truly is who I am. I am a professional who serves. And I guess, in a sense, all of you too are professionals who serve. So I guess it really doesn't matter then whether you're a funeral service professional or, say, a medical service professional. You are still a professional who serves. I guess then the only difference might be your customers and clients get buried in insurance paperwork and mine get buried in, well, you know, you know other places. Now, say for a minute that, that you do what I do. Just imagine for a moment that you're a funeral director and a professional speaker and eh, maybe do a little, little acting on the side. Say you do all those things. But you're also an expert who speaks professionally about service through this very program, Customer Service to Die For. Five service secrets from the funeral profession. And yes, if I were speaking to you for a full 60 minutes, we'd go through all five of the points. And I'd get in depth and customize and, and, and rework every one of those based on the industry or the business that I was in. Just like Tim would do, just like Lisa, Jeff, Betsy would do. Every one of us would customize. So if we were really going through it, <coughs> folks, these would be the five points. Number one, small acts of service make a big difference. Old customer service is dead. Number three, the customer is not always right, but the customer is always in charge. Customer's not always right, but the customer's always in charge. Point number four, smiling, service without sincerity stinks. How's that alliteration, huh? And then number five, service begins and ends at home. And in just a little bit, I'm going to talk about that point number five, that service begins and ends at home. How about this quotation? Service can't just be something you do, ladies and gentlemen. It can't just be lip service. It must be something that you are. We have to have souls of service, meaning it must come from a place very deep within us. You either are a service professional who's passionate about it, or you're not. You either are or you're not. Can you learn it? Can you be trained? Absolutely. But it's got to start somewhere. And, and that caring has to be somewhere deep within you. So we, we try to bring it out. I try to bring it out in my programs and narrow in on, on what it is for you in your profession, wherever you're at in your jobs. I try to do that. Try to do that, folks. So talking about the five points, customer service, to die for in the medical profession. Well, before I get to that, let's say, um, we'll go right there. Just about uh, talking about service beginning and ending at home. You really can't be the best people you can be until you're the best person you can be, until you're, you're the best, well, let's flip that around. You can't be the best professional you can be until you're the best person you can be. And service does begin and end at home. Well, I'll go. 
You just saw that. Let me, let me go right there. Folks, uh, but just about a month ago, just about a month ago, my, my home life got uh, a lot more happy. And the reason being is that our daughter was born. And there she is right there. Ava Elizabeth Zaber. Meet Ava. She's only a month old. Now, the birth of a child isn't necessarily all that unique. It happens every day. It's amazing. It's awesome. But ours is a little bit more unique in the sense that both uh, Ava and my son Owen are both adopted. And we have an open relationship with their birth parents. That's a lot right there. That's a lot of information right there. We were the couple in the hospital that waited on pins and needles for four days just hoping that we'd be able to take our kids home. Because for whatever reason that the medical professionals can't diagnose, we can't do it in the natural way, all on our own. So we have to rely on someone else. And I want to thank the medical professionals, doctors, nurses, staff, employees, for understanding that and making us feel comfortable, making us feel welcome, making us feel appreciated. Because but for the grace of God and but for our kids' birth parents, we wouldn't be parents. And I want to thank medical professionals and staff for recognizing that, understanding that, and appreciating that. Because you all, and you're in here, I know you are, it was not this hospital. But I can just tell by the looks on your faces and the feedback you're giving me non-verbally right now that it very well could have been. So let me take this opportunity to publicly thank you for what you do, providing customer service to die for in big and in little ways. There's, a, there's her latest outfit right there. I love Daddy. <laughs> she's, only a, she's only a month old. And like I said, but for their birth parents, we wouldn't be parents. So we owe a debt of gratitude to many of you sitting in this room right now. On that very point, service beginning and ending at home. Folks, you've all heard, uh, you've all heard the customer service adage, the old adage. Give them the shirt off your back, right? You've all heard that old uh, cliche. Well, sometimes, sometimes you need to do that and more. So, this one particular time I was making funeral arrangements for this family, and the father, the husband, had passed away. Uh, mom was still in a nursing home, so she wasn't there. So the two adult children of the deceased were coming in to make the arrangements. And quite often, I'll hear, I've never done this before, I've never done this before. And all that means to me is I just need to take them by the hand and lead them through it. Um, what they're saying is they've never had to plan funeral. We've all been to funerals, unfortunately. Everybody in this room has been to a visitation or a funeral. The, the percentage of people who've planned it are far less. So that's all they mean when they say that. So I have to take a little extra care, a little extra time, give a little extra service. So it's my opinion, folks, that funeral arrangements should take anywhere from 90 minutes to two hours. Anywhere from 90 minutes to two hours. 60 minutes is probably a little too short. And uh, two and a half hours would be a bit too long. But this family were micro managers. You ever had micro managers that you deal with? Okay, so this family met with me not for two hours, not for four hours, but for six hours over two different days. Now, folks, this wasn't a very complicated funeral arrangement. It was just the type of family that they were overly detailed. They have a ton of questions. They have overly detailed questions. Every question was a debate. Every debate led to a discussion on every single point we're talking about. Have you ever, have you ever had a customer like this? Anybody ever had a customer like this? Okay. So basically, it, it took, a, took a long time. And one of the things that they were fussing over were this gentleman's clothing. One of the things that the daughter especially was unhappy with was this guy's clothing. So she actually wanted to come in and cut her dad's hair. And that's fine. That's fine. We'll let her do it. So she comes in the next day to cut her dad's hair. But ladies and gentlemen, um, she should have left her dad's hair alone because it looked better before she cut it than after she cut it. But, but I'll let her do it. Whatever, whatever it takes to make the customer happy. Whatever it takes. So she goes into the room, 
and she's she's fussing over her dad. She's combing his hair and and adjusting his suit, and he, she's like she's like grunting. She's frustrated. I could tell that that uh, something's not right. And she uh, is looking at his suit coat. She's looking at the tie. She's looking at the shirt, and she says she says I. I I'm just really not happy with the way he looks. I, I don't like the coat. I don't like the way the shirt's laying. I don't like the color. I, and I don't like his tie. I just don't like his tie. But, um, Justin, I, I, I like yours, though. Could, could I, I'm, I'm sorry, could I, could I have your tie? Could I, could I put your tie on? All right. Now, a $50 tie compared to a $10,000 funeral, no big deal. No big deal. I let her have the tie. It was $49.50 at Men's Warehouse. Now, how do I know it was $49.50? Because I had a gift card. And I've never paid $49.50 for a tie in my life. Never done that. But, you know, whatever it takes to make the customer happy, right? Whatever it takes. So, sometimes in life and in business, and in providing customer service to die for, not only do you have to give them the shirt off your back, but sometimes, guys, you gotta give them the tie off your neck as well. But ladies and gentlemen, as it just so happens, I was the last person in the room before closing the <laughs> casket. <laughs> and I really wanted to take that tie. <laughs> But I thought to myself, this would be the micromanager family that asks for one last time to see dad at the cemetery and open that casket. This would be that family, right? But let it be a lesson, folks. Many times it's not the big things that we do. Many times it's the little things, that 1% of the funeral bill that tie costs, even though I was upset about it. Somewhere in the Veterans National Cemetery in Rittman, Ohio, is a nice nautica tie worth $49.50 at Men's Warehouse. It's the little things, right? All right. Folks, uh, I can see that in the last 15, 20 minutes, it hasn't exactly killed you to sit and listen to me speak. But just in case it did, I got you covered. I am Beth's husband and Owen and Ava's father. My name is Justin Zaber. Thank you very much.